Chapter Six of Ward Number Six by Anton Chekhov, translated by Constance Garnett, eighteen sixty one to nineteen forty six. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Six. His life was passed like this. As a rule, he got up at eight o'clock in the morning, dressed and drank his tea. Then he sat down in his study to read, or went to the hospital. At the hospital, the outpatients were sitting in the dark, narrow little corridor, waiting to be seen by the doctor. The nurses and the attendants, tramping with their boots over the brick floors, ran by them. Gaunt-looking patients in dressing gowns passed. Dead bodies and vessels full of filth were carried by. The children were crying, and there was a cold draught. Andrey Yefimitch knew that such surroundings were torture to feverish, consumptive, and impressionable patients. But what could be done in the consulting room he was met by his assistant sergey sergeyitch a fat little man with a plump well-washed shaven face with soft smooth manners wearing a new loosely cut suit and looking more like a senator than a medical assistant he had an immense practice in the town wore a white tie and considered himself more proficient than the doctor who had no practice in the corner of the consulting room there stood a large icon in a shrine with a heavy lamp in front of it and near it a candle stand with a white cover on it on the walls hung portraits of bishops a view of the tsvatogorsky monastery and wreaths of dried cornflowers sergey sergeyitch was religious and liked solemnity and decorum the icon had been put up at his expense at his instructions some one of the patients read the hymns of praise in the consulting room on sundays and after the reading sergey sergeyitch himself went through the wards with a censer and burned incense there were a great many patients but the time was short and so the work was confined to the asking of a few brief questions and the administration of some drugs such as castor oil or volatile ointment andrey yefimitch would sit with his cheek resting in his hand lost in thought and asking questions mechanically sergey sergeyitch sat down too rubbing his hands and from time to time putting in his word we suffer pain and poverty he would say because we do not pray to the merciful god as we should yes andrey yefimitch never performed any operation when he was seeing patients he had long ago given up doing so and the sight of blood upset him when he had to open a child's mouth in order to look at its throat and the child cried and tried to defend itself with its little hands the noise in his ears made his head go round and brought tears to his eyes he would make haste to prescribe a drug and motion to the woman to take the child away he was soon wearied by the timidity of the patients and their incoherence by the proximity of the pious sergey sergeyitch by the portraits on the walls and by his own questions which he had asked over and over again for twenty years and he would go away after seeing five or six patients the rest would be seen by his assistant in his absence with the agreeable thought that thank god he had no private practice now and that no one would interrupt him andrey yefimitch sat down to the table immediately on reaching home and took up a book he read a great deal and always with enjoyment half his salary went on buying books and of the six rooms that made up his abode three were heaped up with books and old magazines he liked best of all works on history and philosophy the only medical publication to which he subscribed was the doctor of which he always read the last pages first he would always go on reading for several hours without a break and without being weary he did not read as rapidly and impulsively as ivan dmitritch had done in the past but slowly and with concentration often pausing over a passage which he liked or did not find intelligible near the books there always stood a decanter of vodka and a salted cucumber or a pickled apple lay beside it not on a plate but on the baize tablecloth every half hour he would pour himself out a glass of vodka and drink it without taking his eyes off the book then without looking at it he would feel for the cucumber and bite off a bit at three o'clock he would go cautiously to the kitchen door cough and say daryushka what about dinner after his dinner a rather poor and untidily served one andrey yefimitch would walk up and down his rooms with his arms folded thinking the clock would strike four then five and still he would be walking up and down thinking 
occasionally the kitchen door would creak and the red and sleepy face of daryushka would appear andrey yefimitch isn't it time for you to have your beer she would ask anxiously no it's not time yet he would answer i'll wait a little i'll wait a little towards the evening the postmaster mihail averyanitch the only man in town whose society did not bore andrey yefimitch would come in mihail averyanitch had once been a very rich landowner and had served in the cavalry but had come to ruin and was forced by poverty to take a job in the post office late in life he had a hale and hearty appearance luxuriant grey whiskers the manners of a well-bred man and a loud pleasant voice he was good-natured and emotional but hot-tempered when any one in the post office made a protest expressed disagreement or even began to argue mihail averyanitch would turn crimson shake all over and shout in a voice of thunder hold your tongue so that the post office had long enjoyed the reputation of an institution which it was terrible to visit mihail averyanitch liked and respected andrey yefimitch for his culture and the loftiness of his soul he treated the other inhabitants of the town superciliously as though they were his subordinates here i am he would say going into andrey yefimitch good evening my dear fellow i'll be bound you are getting sick of me aren't you on the contrary i am delighted said the doctor i am always glad to see you the friends would sit on the sofa in the study and for some time would smoke in silence daryushka what about the beer andrey yefimitch would say they would drink their first bottle still in silence the doctor brooding and mihail averyanitch with a gay and animated face like a man who has something very interesting to tell the doctor was always the one to begin the conversation what a pity he would say quietly and slowly not looking his friend in the face he never looked any one in the face what a great pity it is that there are no people in our town who are capable of carrying on intelligent and interesting conversation or care to do so it is an immense privation for us even the educated class do not rise above vulgarity the level of their development i assure you is not a bit higher than that of the lower orders perfectly true i agree you know of course the doctor went on quietly and deliberately that everything in this world is insignificant and uninteresting except the higher spiritual manifestations of the human mind intellect draws a sharp line between the animals and man suggests the divinity of the latter and to some extent even takes the place of the immortality which does not exist consequently the intellect is the only possible source of enjoyment we see and hear of no trace of intellect about us so we are deprived of enjoyment we have books it is true but that is not at all the same as living talk and converse if you will allow me to make a not quite apt comparison books are the printed score while talk is the singing perfectly true a silence would follow daryushka would come out of the kitchen and with an expression of blank dejection would stand in the doorway to listen with her face propped on her fist eh mihail averyanitch would sigh to expect intelligence of this generation and he would describe how wholesome entertaining and interesting life had been in the past how intelligent the educated class in russia used to be and what lofty ideas it had of honour and friendship how they used to lend money without an i o u and it was thought a disgrace not to give a helping hand to a comrade in need and what campaigns what adventures what skirmishes what comrades what women in the caucasus what a marvellous country the wife of a battalion commander a queer woman used to put on an officer's uniform and drive off into the mountains in the evening alone without a guide it was said that she had a love affair with some princeling in the native village queen of heaven holy mother daryushka would sigh and how we drank and how we ate and what desperate liberals we were andrey yefimitch would listen without hearing he was musing as he sipped his tea i often dream of intellectual people in conversation with them he said suddenly interrupting mihail averyanitch my father gave me an excellent education but under the influence of the ideas of the sixties made me become a doctor i believe if i had not obeyed him then by now i should have been in the very centre of the intellectual movement most likely i should have become a member of some university of course intellect too is transient and not eternal but you know why i cherish a partiality for it life is a vexatious trap 
when a thinking man reaches maturity and attains to full consciousness he cannot help feeling that he is in a trap from which there is no escape indeed he is summoned without his choice by fortuitous circumstances from non-existence into life what for he tries to find out the meaning and object of his existence he is told nothing or he is told absurdities he knocks and it is not open to him death comes to him also without his choice and so just as in prison men held together by common misfortune feel more at ease when they are together so one does not notice the trap in life when people with a bent for analysis and generalization meet together and pass their time in the interchange of proud and free ideas in that sense the intellect is a source of an enjoyment nothing can replace perfectly true not looking his friend in the face andrey yefimitch would go on quietly and with pauses talking about intellectual people in conversation with them and mikhail avrianitch would listen attentively and agree perfectly true and you do not believe in the immortality of the soul he would ask suddenly no honoured mikhail avrianitch i do not believe it and have no grounds for believing it i must own i doubt it too and yet i have a feeling as though i should never die oh i think to myself old fogey it is time you were dead but there is a little voice in my soul says don't believe it you won't die soon after nine o'clock mikhail avrianitch would go away as he put on his fur coat in the entry he would say with a sigh what a wilderness fate has carried us to though really what's most vexatious of all is to have to die here Ech. End of chapter 6. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine.